So I found myself uh, starting to try to produce this 200 page document on my own. And at the beginning, I thought, wow, this is, this is a huge drag and it's a big bureaucracy and it's a waste of time and all this. But they made, you know, they essentially forced me to do things like convene a meeting of all the engineers and sit there for an hour and try to think of every way we could kill somebody with our device. Every single thing. What happens if somebody trips over the power cord in the operating room? What happens if um, there's a, um, a, uh, uh, a non-grounded uh, wire or something and, and a patient gets shocked? It turns out that during surgery, if you have a non-grounded device and there's a spark, well, when you're doing GI surgery, there can be gases released in the OR and people can literally blow up. I mean, this, this is a, this is like one of these crazy things that you would never think about unless you really dive deep into all the things that can go wrong in an operating room. And believe me, a lot of things have gone wrong in operating rooms. So they really want you to sit back, talk to other people, and then you make a report of all the things that could ever go wrong. This is called the failure mode effects analysis. And then you report, you, that's one of the documents you give to them. Of course, you also want to give them the mitigating strategies for all of these things. Like we have um, you know, special grounding devices so we don't have shocks in the OR and, um, and things like that. So by the time we were done with this, we had a really amazing piece of, uh, of equipment, I think, and, and piece of software. J just to give you an idea, we ran our software for six months without stopping at some point, and when we exited out of the software and looked at the number of unreleased uh, memory buffers, it was zero. So we were able to produce a really clean piece of software and, and really comprehensively address all the risks associated with it. So when I started thinking about all the problems around face recognition, I, I, I started thinking more and more about all the things I'd been through uh, in these procedures, and it just struck me that, um, that this was for modeling uh, our, our face recognition issues with. <laughs> and I, just to give you the, 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 the impression you get when you start working with the FDA is, oh my God, they thought of everything. They thought of everything that could go wrong and all the stuff um, um, that you need to make drugs and medical devices safe and effective. So here are some, some examples. Um, who should verify devices safe and effective? Trained engineers and safety experts that work with the FDA. Who should be able to prescribe drugs? An MD. Now already this is interesting, right? Like simply to get a drug, you have to go to somebody who's been in the U.S., who's been to uh, seven years of school, beyond high school at least, an MD, and has graduated with a particular degree from an accredited institution. So, you know, we have nothing like this at all for face recognition. Who should be able to distribute drugs? Now, this is really amazing if you think about it. Imagine going back 100 years and saying, you know, before you can have a drug, you need a trained person to pick it up from this box and put it in that box. I mean, that's basically what a pharmacist is. Now, of course, I'm, I'm kind of belittling their profession, but they're actually highly trained uh, to properly distribute and, and, um, and manage drugs in, in terms of keeping them safe and, and uh, at the right temperature and giving people instructions and all this stuff. Um, how should you dispose of unwanted drugs? This is one of my favorite ones. I never would have thought of this in a million years, but here's the drug disposal options when you want to get rid of a drug. Is it on the FDA flush list? So they literally have a list of all the drugs that you can flush down the toilet or not. Um, so, so that just shows you how far these things go. And um, I, I won't go through all the rest of these, but I'll just mention one more, which is, this is a critical one. How risky is your device? The first thing you do when you're trying to convince them that your device is safe and effective is you put it in the risk category. It's either a low risk, medium risk, or high risk device. And of course, if it's a low risk device, the number of things you have to demonstrate about it is much lower than if, um, if it's a high risk device. And once again, we have nothing like this in face recognition. Everybody knows it's true. If you, you, you wouldn't 
would want to attach your face recognition algorithm to an automatic weapon system that kills people as soon as it thinks they know who they are. Um, but we need an explicit way of categorizing risks associated with different uh, applications um, in order to start managing this process reasonably. Um, another one that I think is really important is if you have a medical device um, and it malfunctions, you have to report it to the FDA and say what happened. So I was hired by a company in uh, 1993 and put in charge of a medical device that malfunctioned all the time. And it was incredibly stressful um, because the president of the company had invented the device and he told me to go teach doctors how to use it and it was malfunctioning all the time. It, and, it was a, and it was a brain surgery device. So uh, if you think your job is stressful, come talk to me about that after the, uh, after the, uh, the talk. But um, basically, I ended up getting the device recalled by continually reporting its malfunctions to the FDA. Uh, and that was the right thing to do you know, that device should never have been on the market. And because I was a conscientious employee and because these regulations were in place, I was able to get that done. Whereas if I just had an argument with my boss, I just would have been fired, right? So uh, I think that's a really, really important uh, aspect of this. Okay, so let's get back to faces. Um, as I was saying a minute ago, you know, one of the first things we need to do is classify things according to risk. Um, and um, I also want to talk about intended use and how intended use affects risk. So, um, of course, not all medical devices represent the same risks. Um, you have class one, class two, and class three devices. And just some examples, like a class one device is like a tongue depressor where you go, ah. And a class two device would be like a suture or stitches or blood pressure cuffs. And a class three device would be like an implantable pacemaker. If something goes wrong with it, you can die instantly. Um, and so these things are regulated very differently. And you, they have lots of help to help you understand what the risk of your device is. So, Here's a, a key thing that I think we have to understand in face recognition, which is two identical pieces of software can be used for completely different things. And, and the same thing's true of medical devices. So I can have an electrode that's taped on my chest to do an EKT to measure my heart signals. And there's almost no risk associated with that device. There's almost nothing bad it can do to me. So it's a class one device. I can also have the same exact electrode implanted in my brain during surgery to detect my epilepsy. And, and that is a much more serious thing that turns it into a class three device. So what something is used for is a key part of its risk assessment. And when you say this out loud, it sounds completely obvious, but my argument really is that we need to start defining these things and making them clear to everybody so that we're all on the same page. So consider two different uses of the same software. I can use software to identify people for sorting personal photos, and I can identify people for attack by an automatic weapon system. And these are clearly, uh, you know, these are the two extremes of the risk categories. Um, you know, if I make a mistake sorting people's photos, well, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but if I kill somebody by misidentifying them, that's pretty tragic. So. Um, so, so what does that mean? It means that we're actually not trying to regulate software in terms of a binary file or a trained algorithm. We're trying to regulate a combination of software and a, and a, um, a context in which it's used. And, and we call this a deployment, okay? So a deployment, you could have the same software in two different deployments and it will be regulated completely differently. Um, so if I fail to demonstrate a certain level of accuracy, I may not be able to deploy my software as a class three device, but I may be able to class, uh, deploy it as a class one device. Um, okay, so let's look at, I've got 10 minutes. Um, so 
the, one of the keys is to have a very detailed definition of the intended use of software and to make sure people stay within that intended use. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about what intended use might look like, and we're working hard to develop these definitions, and then how it can be quite tricky to decide whether you're actually using something according to its intended <coughs> use or not. Uh, so that's where I'm heading. Okay, so let's just use the following definition for the moment, the intended use of a piece of uh, software is the allowable parameters of use um, for a particular replication software package. For example, only to be used in daylight conditions, only to be used on people over 16 years old, only to be used on high resolution images with a certain interocular distance. Um, that, now the, the next one is my own term, decision action delay of 24 hours. And by this I mean, this, if the software tells you something like, this is John Smith, I have to wait 24 hours before I can take any action on that. And we'll talk about why that is in a minute. Um, and, I, and this is just an example. Okay, so the intended use could be totally different for a different piece of software. Um, and maybe this particular piece of software can run on smartphones, and only smartphones. Um, okay, so once again, a deployment is a distribution and use of a specific piece of face recognition software. And a valid deployment is a distribution and use consistent with the improved intended use. An invalid deployment is using it uh, in a way that's inconsistent with the approved intended use. Okay, so let's look at an example so we can think about some of the issues that come up when we start trying to define this stuff. Uh, how am I doing? Okay. Um, okay, so imagine that you, you work for a company and you just had your software that you're developing approved for use by the, the FDA for for face recognition software. It's been approved for use by police to match subjects to a felony database. And you have very carefully defined uh, the intended use, and that includes the arrest of a subject who's been matched. Um, and another piece of the intended use is that it's not to be used on subjects less than 18 years of age. And one of the arguments you made to this new FDA was that when the software is used according to its intended use, with the intended population, under the intended settings, and so forth, the accuracy rate was 99.999%. So that sounds pretty good. Um, okay, so you deploy the software, and a police officer uses the software to analyze a subject walking on the street, and the software returns a match. So basically, the, the officer points the software at a person and says, this is John Smith, age 22 years old. And the question I'm now posing to you is, was the software used according to its intended use, and can the officer arrest this person? So how many people think it was used, or, or think it's uh, clear that the software was used according to its intended use? How many people think it was? Raise your hand. Nobody? Or how many people think it wasn't used, according, or it may not have been used according to its intended use? Okay, and, wh and why? Anybody? It doesn't go through the age classification, right? The What's that? The software does not uh, do age uh, estimation. So I, I cannot say. Excellent, right. So the, now the police officer is gonna think, oh, the person I just pointed to that is 22 years old. But that's not what happened. It thought it was John Smith, and John Smith is 22 years old. So uh, it turns out that actually um, it was not John Smith. It was Bill Miller, who's age 17. And now you say, wait a minute. I thought this software was 99.999% accurate. But we're not using it in the situation that it was intended for, because the guy's too young. And you might say, that's a crazy example. That, that, that doesn't make any sense. Actually, this exact thing happened to Apple. 
because when Apple released their iPhone 10 software, they said, well, I shouldn't say it's the exact same thing, a similar thing happened to them. They said, this software is so awesome, it works for everybody. And then what happened, does anybody know the problem with the iPhone 10 software? It doesn't work on kids. It, it, kids' faces are so much more similar than adults that the error rate is, is quite high on kids. And after advertising all over the planet that this stuff worked on everybody, they, they had to eat crow and come back and say, actually, everybody except everybody who's less than 13. Um, so uh, it was a huge embarrassment to them. And <coughs> it shows how industry is often overestimating. Well, they're not necessarily overestimating the accuracy, but they're just, they're not really providing the evidence that the software works in the way that they're claiming it works. And one reason I bring up this example is because I actually think regulation like this is good both for the public and for the companies because this was hugely embarrassing to Apple and um, it, you know they didn't want to go through that. If they had had the option to not make that big marketing mistake, they definitely would have taken it. So if you know what your software can actually do and you actually have data that supports it, then you should be much more confident in the claims you're making. And, and that's good for everybody. It's good for the companies and it's good for the public. So the, the main point of this example is that some of you in here guess this, but for non-technical audiences, almost nobody understands the fact that this is not an appropriate use. They don't understand that when the software says there's John Smith in age 22, that that was based on a recognition mismatch and not an age mismatch. Um, so, uh, so it's really important to understand these things. And, and so I want to go back um, for a second to my comment about waiting 24 hours before you use software to do something. So if I make an arrest um, and it's the wrong person, you might say, well, big deal, you know, they'll figure it out later. But, but you know, you have to accept the reality that if somebody grabs your arms and puts them behind your back and shoves your face against a car, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I'd have the self-control to not react to that. I mean, it, it takes somebody who's really mature and calm and not a hothead like me to not react to that. So even though it's just an arrest, it can lead to escalation and all kinds of other problems. And so this suggests th there's really no good way for the police officer to know that the software was wrong in this point unless they corroborate it with some other evidence, okay? So for example, when the, F when the FBI uses face recognition software and they can match, they usually corroborate it with other information like where does the person live, what did they appear with people that we know that they're related to and so forth, and they can verify that it's correct before they actually go out and drag the person in. So software used without corroboration has much, much higher risks than software used with corroboration so that suggests a dividing line in terms of risk classification. So these are the kinds of things that we're trying to, to uh, define right now. So uh, I think I'm almost out of time, so I'm just gonna um, wrap up. I'm working on a grant from the MacArthur Foundation right now to write a, a white paper um, about all these issues and, and try to establish definitions and risk categories and things like that. I mean, these are just initial suggestions for policymakers, and I'm talking to uh, re the research organization for the U.S. Congress to try to um, get them to support these kinds of ideas um, so that we can start moving forward. And again, I want to emphasize that I think this is a positive thing for industry as well as for the public because when people lump all face recognition applications together, then people tend to freak out because they know that the negative implications can be really bad. But if we can separate things into low risk and medium risk and high risk categories, 
that we can really have the appropriate degree of regulation for every level. I'll give you one last example, which is we all love transfer learning, right? You, you train on one data set and you transfer to another data set. You know, if you ask me, it should be fine to do transfer learning for a social media app. That you, you, the accuracy might not be that great, and maybe over time it could get better as it looks at more unlabeled data. That's fine, but you don't want to do transfer learning for like a police arrest application. In that case, you want to actually gather data from the population that you're working with. So you can have a police officer wear a camera for a few years so that they get actually a good model of the population they're working with, and that could be a requirement for a class two or class three risk application. Okay, so um, I've talked about all these things. Um, so, you know, this technology is very complex and it has massive implications for society. And, you know, we've got great cases of success out there for the management of such complex systems. Two of these are the US FDA's, the management of medical devices and pharmaceuticals. There are other examples like the FAA, the, the Federal Aviation Association, is that what it is? Federal Aviation. Anyway, they regulate flight and airplanes and all that, and they do a great job. Um, but as I said before, I'd love to hear from all of you if you think I'm crazy or if I'm on the wrong course or if you have ideas uh, that you'd like to see discussed in, in this kind of work. Um, so I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you. Being, 